Praise the Lord and a very good evening to you. Thank you for joining us on this day for the Bible study, wherever you're watching us from. We bless the Lord for you and we give him all the glory. We want you to press the share button. We are still on the book of Nehemiah and it will be a blessing. Begin to tag our brothers and sisters. We realize that after our Facebook update and programming, some people cannot receive the notification of the Bible study. So we encourage you to be your brother's keeper. Invite them, tell a friend to tell a friend. Uh, begin to share, invite as many people as possible. And let's learn the word. The best thing that God could give humanity is his own word. The Bible says in the beginning God created the world. And the world was created um, you know, in the beginning God. And he's the one who created the world. And the world was created by the speech of the word. So we have the raw material of creation. We have everything that God will give us. He has given us the word and the Holy Spirit. And with these two entities, we have more than enough to win, conquer, and rebuild this world. So invite your friends and everybody, even as we make a prayer, our psalm of the week was Psalms 1, uh, verse 3, that, you know, a blessed is the man uh, planted beside many waters because he bears fruit in and out of season. And it is my prayer that this week the Lord is going to cause us to flourish, uh, no east wind, nothing is going to make us lose productivity, and above all, we shall remain planted beside many waters, a place of supply and sustenance. Let's believe and pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we bless your name. We give you praise, we give you honor, we adore you, we bless your holy name. Thank you for life, thank you for eternal life, thank you for yet another week. We secure the gates of this week in the spirit, we declare this week we are winning, this week, oh Father, is the week of us bearing fruits and increasing and multiplying. We declare that we are planted in you, we are in Christ, hidden in God, far above powers, principalities, and even rulers of darkness. We declare, my God, this is the week of good news, good reports of Father, our our paths are shining brighter. You are leading us in the coordinates of our ordinances. Your hand is upon us to cause us to prevail over every assignment and attack of the enemy. This week we are singing a new song. We are declaring new things, O oh Father. This week we are walking in the realities and in the illumination of your word. This week we are walking under revelation. The grace has been multiplied. We have divine capacity. We are established in you. This week, O oh Father, we are for signs and wonders. This week we shall see you in every area, every sphere, and every sector of our lives. We declare this the week of divine encounters, testimonies. You are opening doors, O oh Father. We are entering realms and dimensions, even in the realms of the Spirit. My God, we thank you. Even in the Bible study, we declare that your grace has already been poured. We have understanding. Revelation has already been released. And, O oh God, we are articulating the realities of Scripture, Lord, with accuracy and proximity. We bless you. We give you, we give you praise and we glorify you holy name. Take charge even tonight, O oh God. May you be glorified and may your name be edified. Even as we read Nehemiah chapter number 9, Lord, we pray that you shall be with us and you shall give us the utterance and even the, the tongue of a learned man and also above all the simplicity of the execution of your word. And it is in Jesus' name that we do pray and believe. Hallelujah. So today we are going to look at Nehemiah chapter number 9. Uh, we will look at Nehemiah chapter number 9, and uh, it's an amazing read. Um, this is after the law was read, and we are going to read. Now, let's begin from verse 1. The Bible says, Now on the 12th, 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it they made confession and worshipped the Lord their God. On the stairs of the Levi stood Jeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shebania, Buni, Sherebiah, Bani, and Chenani. And they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Kedmiel, Bani, ha Hashbenia, Sherebia, Hodia, Shebania, and Pethahia said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You are the Lord, you alone, you have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth, and all that is on it, the sea, and all that is in them, and you preserve all 
all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord, the God, who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made with him the covenant to give to his offspring the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Gigashites. And you have kept your promise for you are righteous. And you saw the affliction of, uh, of our fathers in Egypt and uh, had their crime at the Red Sea and performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of his land. For, the, for you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers and you made a name for yourself as it is to this day. And you divided the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land and you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. By a pillar of cloud you led them in the day and by a pillar of fire in the night to light for them the way in which they should go. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments, and you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them commandment and statutes and a law by Moses your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock for their thirst, and you told them to go in to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiff, stiffened their necks and they did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them, but they stiffened their necks and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. Even when they had made for themselves a golden calf and said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt and had committed great blasphemies, you in your great mercies did not forsake them uh, in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud to lead them in the way did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way by which they should go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. And you gave them kingdoms and peoples and allotted to them every corner. So they took possession of the land of Sihon. Horn, king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. You multiplied, sorry, you multiplied um, uh, uh, their children as the stars of heaven, and you brought them into the land that you had told their fathers to enter and possess. So the descendants went in and possessed the land, and you subdued before them the inhabitant of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them into their hand with their kings and the people of the land, that they might do with them as they would. And they captured fortified cities and a rich land, and took possession of houses full of all good things, cisterns, already hewn, vineyard, all orchards and fruit trees in Abaddon. So they ate and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back and killed your prophets who had won them in order to turn them back to you. And they committed great blasphemies. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of their enemies who made them suffer. And in the time of their suffering, they carried, they cried out to you and you heard them from heaven. And according to your great mercy, is you gave them saviors who saved them from the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they did evil again before you and you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they turned and cried to you, you heard from heaven and many times you delivered them according to your mercies and you warned them in order to turn them back to your law. Yet they acted presumptuously and did not obey your commandments but sinned against um, against um, your rules, which if a person does them, he shall live by them, and they turn a stubborn shoulder and stiffen their necks and will not obey. Many years you bore with them and won them by their spirit, by your spirit through the prophets, yet they will not give ear. Therefore you gave them into the hand of the people of land. Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or, or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who keeps covenant 
covenant and steadfast love. Let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us, upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all you people since the time of the kings of Assyria, Assyria until this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us. You, for you have dealt faithfully and we have acted wickedly. Our kings, our princes, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your warning that you gave them. Even in their own kingdom and amid your great goodness that you gave them and in the large and rich land that you said before them they did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. Behold, we are slaves this day in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves. And its richly yields go to the king whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule of our bodies and of our livestock as they please, and we are in great distress. Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. Yes, it's a long reading, but it's an amazing reading. From... Nehemiah 9 from verse 1, from, from verse 1 all the way to verse 4, we are introduced to the, 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 the 24th day. Of course, this was in the seventh month. We saw that um, the first uh, six chapters, just to give a recap because we're in a new week, the first six chapters from Nehemiah 1 all the way to 6, we saw that uh, this was the process of rebuilding the wall. And now we come back now from chapter number seven, we have the genealogy, chapter number eight, we have now the rebuilding of the people. Because you can have a wall and a temple, but you don't have the people. And we saw, I think, if not six, seven, um, you know, kind of attacks or things that the enemy will always use to stop the work. Uh, we saw that Nehemiah was attacked with mockery and discouragement. There was internal sin. Um, there was also the place, uh, uh, the place of violence where Tobias said we, we are launching on war. And so there was the place of threats of war and also violence just to bring fear. There was also the battle of honor where they were called in the valley and they wanted to kill him. And then there was the conspiracy of Shemaiah, the man who said, come, you know, let's go and hide in the temple. And, and now, of course, this was supposed to affect his integrity. And finally, there was the concept of accusation. So from chapter number one to chapter number six, you will find these uh, battles aligned and also summarized in that particular order. You find them summarized in that particular order. And then chapter number 8, now we see the restoration of the people. And in chapter number 8, we saw a very powerful prophetic picture that Ezra stood on a wooden platform and it was at the water gate. And we say that the water gate represents the word of God. So prophetically, he was watering Israel. And now, after that, we begin to see some of the consequences of the word of God. Because anytime the word of God is delivered, that word delivers men. The revival is always men hearing the truth and then getting convicted with the truth and then the desire for men to go back to God. You need to understand that we don't need to help the word. We just need to present the word as it is. The word by itself is already very powerful. We don't need to help the word. We just need to present the word without doctoring it, without trying to make it look relevant, without trying to make it look like, you know, some, some parts are very tough. You just present the word. Stand on it and the word will do its work. So chapter number 9 is a product. Chapter number 9, chapter number 10, 11, and 12, you know, it's like after, after the Ezra encounter, the nation entered into an awakening, a revival. So chapter number 9, remember in this seventh month, there were three festivals. There was the festival of the booths, there was the festival of trumpets, and there was the day of atonement. And even when we were doing the Bible study, someone who lives in Israel, Tel Aviv, told me, in fact, we've just cleared the festival of the booths last week. And she sent me a picture of the booth she had created. And it was amazing because now some of these things now become real and you can see them uh, wherever you are. So these three festivals were in the month 
of um, the seventh month. But the thing that they were launching, this national prayer and fasting. Now, this is a real national prayer day. <laughs> the, this national prayer and fasting was not in the calendar of Israel. But this was a product of the delivered word. The people, after the law was read to them, they saw where they missed the mark. And they now understood that they were living in sin. Because there's one thing that happens when we deliver the word. Number one is that the word begins to deliver the people. It causes conviction. It opens the eyes. It takes away the veil of darkness. And people see the truth. And people see how far they have fallen from the ways of the Father. And the word now begins to convict them to go back to the, to the ancient path and the ways. And that is why the devil may never fight the gathering of men. The devil will always fight the announcement of the right teaching. Remember, a prophet can deceive a congregation, but a teacher can deceive generations. So when, when, when we are under strange teachings, we are also uh, sowing discord in the next generation. And that's why the battle is not against assemblies. It's not against denominations. You can have as many denominations as you want. You can build as many churches as you want. The battle is always on the right sound and the right doctrine. And so uh, anyone that preaches the truth, sometimes they are not the famous, you, you, you may not find them on TV, you may, they, they may not be the very popular people on your day-to-day -day journals because even the devil hates when the truth is delivered. Because chapter number 9 is a picture of the truth. The people had the truth and the Bible says on the 24th day of this month, this was the seventh month, uh, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth. Now you will realize Everywhere the name fasting is mentioned, it is always an accompaniment because fasting is not prayer. Fasting is an accompaniment of prayer. So if you fast, if you fast is the denial, you know, denying yourself, especially food. I, I've seen people trying to be a little bit modern. Uh, people have tried to be modern. The, 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 the root definition of fasting is denying yourself food. And sometimes even drink. <laughs> now I hear people now they say, you know, you can fast TV. You know, I'm fasting Facebook. My friend, you are joking. We, we are not here to, these, these are not things. This, 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 I don't know even how to say it. <laughs> I know when you fast, you can decide to avoid Facebook because of the time that you spend on Facebook. But Facebook does not make you add weight. Because the fasting is disciplining the proclivities of the flesh. So this 21st century kind of fasting where people are fasting Facebook, fasting TV, um, what else do they fast? Oh, these have, I'm deciding to fast WhatsApp. I'm, I'll not be on WhatsApp. Th these are jokes. The, when you look at Daniel, the Bible says the man never ate anything. And the man went on his knees and he never left that place until there was a divine intervention. Th and that's why we are not getting the results of the patriarchs of faith. How can you fast Facebook and say you are fasting? In fact, Facebook even just needs discipline for you to avoid. You waste a lot of time on Facebook. So at the end of the day, this is what you need to understand. Is that real fast, real fast, is when you deny this, this belly and this body food. And you begin to conquer the appetites of the flesh. And align your flesh to the, to the proclivities of the spirit. Because you have three entities. Man is a triune being tetrapite being. You have a body, soul, and spirit. And these entities, the body is seeking to rule. The spirit is seeking to rule. The entity that you feed will, will control the one that you don't feed. If you feed the flesh more, then the spirit will be under the masses of the flesh. If you feed the spirit more, the flesh will be under the masses of the spirit. And I tell you, when the spirit is awakened, even Facebook will not be an issue. You, you will not need to fast. You look at it and ask yourself, what value does it add to my spiritual life? So if all these things about Facebook and all, they, they, they are just, it is an extra manifestation of a man that has not conquered the flesh. And so this becomes an accompaniment uh, that they were assembled with fasting.
So with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. So they used to pick dust and pour it on their heads. And it was a sign of, Lord, we are not worthy to stand before your presence. The sackcloth was a way of taking anything that will give them comfort. Because it is a sign of showing how uncomfortable they were without a relationship with the Father. So they had to put on the sackcloth and just appear. This was a, this was a, a, a physical process prophetic gesture of what they felt inside, filthy, rejected, no relationship, cut off. And, 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 and most of the times, if it was a king or a prophet who had something that the Lord was mad, we saw them tearing their garments. A king will tear his garment and wear a, uh, you wear a sackcloth and say, no, I cannot be in my royal robes at the expense of my relationship with my father. These are serious spiritual matters. We cannot be casual with them. And that's why anyone that decides to take a fast, the second thing, it's not a saving scheme. The money you save through fasting, if you're taking a 21 days fasting, and maybe you are saying I'll not take breakfast and lunch, and only be taking something in the evening, you need to quantify that money. The first way you can be a blessing to the people around you who have no food, to the widow, the street family, the sojourners, be a blessing to them. The second thing, you can put that money in an envelope and release it as an offering in church because fasting is not a saving scheme. And the Bible says, um, and the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. Two things happened. Um, uh, um, so the first thing is that when the word was read, they chose this day, 24th day, National Day of Prayer, and they were assembled in one place, and they were gathering to seek the face and the relationship of their God through fasting and prayer. Now, what does fasting do? Fasting accelerates your capacity to download from the spiritual realm. Um, you see, uh, it's like you have a pipe, and, and the pipe is clogged, and, and you have water coming from the tank. So it means as long as the pipe is clogged, the amount of water that comes from the tap is limited. That does not mean that you don't have enough water in the tank. It doesn't mean that you don't have the right tap. It means that the pipe is clogged. So when you take away the clog from the pipe, you increase the amount of water that the pipe can handle. And also the tap, whatever the tap releases, the pressure increases. Most of the times when we fast, we don't help God. Fasting is like unclogging that pipe and increasing capacity to receive the flow of the Spirit. The tank is like the Holy Ghost, full with the, with the, with the anointing and the things of the Spirit. But the, the flesh limits the flow, what can flow. So when we begin to fast, we accelerate the space of flow. And that's why when you are taking a true fast and you are genuine with what you are doing, there is always a certain level of alertness in the spirit. Your discernment, your antennas are always very high. You can pick signals very accurately. Why? You have increased the source of your frequency. Uh, in church, I'm teaching something called the, the anatomy of the spirit. It's a series that I've been pursuing for a couple of months. And I discovered in the spirit of man, in the spirit of man, um, there is a place called communion, and then there is the consciousness of the spirit, the consciousness. Everyone, even those who are not born again, they have a consciousness of the spirit. And I tell you the truth, the consciousness of the spirit, if well exercised, whether born again or not born again, it can pick some levels of data from the realm of the spirit. And that is why by fasting and a sustained fasting by fasting even non-believers can download some spiritual realities this is the system that witches use they fast a lot because it increases their capacity to download from the realm of the spirit the realm of the spirit is governed by laws and anyone who knows the law can access that realm so we have strange men who access that realm and we have men who are in church ordained of God lazy and they have no advantage and they cannot access that realm because it takes discipline to abide by the laws of the spirit and one of them is fasting and and you, you can never have a complete fast if the second thing does not happen separation so the people are separated so the consciousness of the spirit is triggered even when our muslim brothers are fasting for 40 days them that keep that fast 
<laughs> I had a relative who was a Muslim, and, and she used to fast. Most of her life, she used to fast. And I tell you the truth, her intelligence in some matters, it sounded like prophetic. It sounded like the prophetic, but of course through a different channel. Because it opens your spirit man to access the realm of the spirit. So it, the, 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 these things were not, the, they were not ordained for witches and the wicked. These are privileges for the saints. But we don't enjoy them because it takes a prize. Spiritual things call for a demand. It, there is a prize. Our fathers will tell you, kuna garama ya kutembea katika roho. There is a prize you pay to walk in the spirit. It's not automatic. It's not in ordinary Sunday church attendance. It's not in ordinary um, fellowships. There is a price, and it's not easy. And that is why not everyone walks in it, because very few people are willing to pay the price. So let's go to the context. So the people were in their sackcloth, and they separated themselves from all foreigners. Um, and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. Now, we have to see something here. There is sin and there is iniquity of their fathers. There is sin and there is iniquity of their fathers. Now, sin, sin is the actions. Sin is the actions of what they had done. We saw what Nehemiah blamed them for. They had intermarried, they had foreign wives. Um, in chapter number two, we saw some of the Jews were extorting their own brothers. And it was not right. So sin is a product of the actions. Iniquity is a whole different dimension. Because the devil was not judged for sin. The devil was judged for iniquity. And sometimes iniquity can manifest as an action of sin. For me, iniquity goes to the dimension of intention. And it is a spiritual thing. I want you to listen carefully. Because the... the, the, the when you see God judging the iniquities of the fathers up to the fourth generation, the, anyone that understands spiritual warfare, they will tell you some cities are shaped the way they are shaped because of generational iniquities of the fathers that were not dealt with. I, I remember we, we, we were in a meeting in the south. Uh, and it was an apostolic gathering. And one of the apostles stood. One of the apostles stood. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a man I, I, I respect, Apostle John. And he stood and he said, Father, we repent for the sins of the fathers. That was South Africa. And we repent for the iniquities of the fathers. And he said, now let the heavens open. And, and when he was praying that prayer, he was identifying with the apathy that happened in South Africa, identifying with the bloodshed, the political, you know, uh, turmoil that was in that area, and some of the things that were laid by the fathers. Now, this is what happens. The iniquities of the fathers open doors for demonic activities. I, I, just, I want you to listen to me carefully. Like, I come from Limuru. I was doing the research of the area, and in my research, I discovered there is something called the Larry Massacre. Now, the Larry Massacre was a product of um, the, the, the Mau Maus went and killed a, a local chief in Larry who was considered as a traitor. And they killed him and the wife and the children. They left only one surviving wife. And one of the wife was pregnant. They, you know, slit him and, you know, tore his belly and the governor in Nairobi decided to send some soldiers and more than 200 young people were killed and the blood was shed and they were buried in a mass grave. Now, when you go to that area, you can sense that this unforgiveness is still there. 
When you go to that area, you can sense that there were vows and covenants that people made concerning anything that came with the white people. Now, in such an area, there is the iniquities of the fathers. And we are not talking about fathers African only. Even those who committed the mass bloodshed, by that killing, they would have opened a demonic portal that now gives legal ground for demons to torment the city. Now you enter in a city, you find there is hardness to penetrate, and the problem is you have not taken responsibility to deal with the iniquities of the fathers. Now the sins of the fathers and the iniquities of the fathers, they open a spiritual door and a legal operation of the demonic. That's exactly what happens. They open a spiritual door and they give the demonic realm a legal operation. And every territory, when you go and begin to do spiritual mapping, you must understand. And now let's come to our own homes. You come from a home. You don't know what kind of things had happened. The iniquities of the fathers. And, this, and, and I'm bringing it very close home because... In the realms, in the spiritual, in, in, the, in the physical, when you deny a child, if you have a child today and you deny the child, they will go and check your DNA. They will tell you, no, we just need your blood sample. There, there is a pattern that is in the blood. And that pattern is found in your son that you are denying your daughter. If these patterns are similar, it means there was a transfer that happened that can manifest physically. And that tells you, when you begin to look at the iniquities of the father, some of these iniquities are transferred spiritually. Oh, Jesus. They're transferred spiritually. They're transferred spiritually. The, the way there is a DNA transferred physically, you can have a spiritual iniquity transferred spiritually. And this answers the question of, you can have a child of a bishop born again, a powerful bishop, but the child is an addict and a drunkard. Not because the father doesn't pray. Not because the child was not raised in the godly ways. But because possibly there was a transfer of a certain iniquity. This explains also the concept of some addictions. You, you are filled with the Holy Ghost. You are born again. You go to church, you do all these things. But there is something that has refused to live your life. And when you connect it directly, I'm not saying all of them, but when you do spiritual scanning, you might discover you are dealing with an iniquity of the fathers. And that's why you have to repent. Because what happens when you repent about the iniquities of the fathers? You deny the demons the legal ground to attack you. Because repentance, I remember there was a time we were doing deliverance to a lady. And the demon was so stubborn. It was not living. We were in a Kesha. And we prayed, we prayed. And the next thing, I picked in the spirit. And I told two of my pastors, repent on behalf of his father. Begin to repent on behalf of his father. Because this demon showed up because of the errors of his father. And guess what? When they began that repentance, the demon left. Because now it did not have a legal ground to stay in that young girl. Because the legal ground was the iniquity of the father. And that's why now the Lord begins to show us how far up to the fourth generation. And a generation constitutes between 50 to 100 years. So we are talking about a gap of 400 years. My Jesus. <laughs> um... And, and it's just wisdom. This repentance is supposed to be by faith.
is supposed to be a repentance out of faith and just. And that's why some of these things, as you begin to pray and fast, the Holy Ghost will open your eyes in the spirit, lead you, drop something in your spirit and tell you, begin to repent because of the sins of your fathers. Begin to declare they have no power over your life and over your children. And as you're praying, these are prayers of identification. You go down on your knees and pray as if you're the one who sinned. And then after that, what you're doing, you're denying the demons the legal ground for their operation. And I'll tell you the truth. Some of these things have been watered down. And some of these things are the reason why many believers don't walk in the freedom of their faith. Because they were watered down by rational thinking, philosophical thinking, and logical thinking. The gate, every demonic door, is opened by a man. And the fact that you are born in a certain family, there are demons that are legally there. And it takes a man to understand the door that was open and shut that door to terminate the legality of this particular power. So the iniquities, the desires, the deep-rooted sins of our fathers, when you come from a family of satanist, occultic men, witches, wizards, men that raised demonic altars, people that participated in mass murder, death of people. When you come from a lineage of such a home, maybe your father was used for some activities of killing men or he was serving possibly somewhere and maybe, um, you know, your great-grandfather was a bloody man. In that area, you're dealing with the iniquities of the fathers where occultic cultures, satanism, demonic practices, Freemasonry, witchcraft, wizard, where there was mass death and mass burial, and you know, people that were involved in bloodshed. The, by the time all these things were done, a gate of iniquity was open, and these things begin to torment the children. I, I met a man we were, I don't know why the Holy Ghost has made me to pause here, but I met a man and he told me um, where he lives, the neighbor was a very powerful government man. And this was the man who used to execute the enemies of the president. He was a senior man in some government. And anyone, any, any government execution was done by him. And guess what? Two of his children are mad, literally insane. And what has happened in such a person if nobody realizes that the hands of this man are bloody, the grandchildren might end up suffering things that they don't even know. Because a door was opened and iniquity is driving and the demonic realm has more power. And this is the place of repentance. And when you look at the details of Israel repentance, there is revelation. So we see that they, they were not just dealing with anything. The moves of God are hindered sometimes with iniquities of cities and iniquities of the land. And it takes men to have intelligence to begin to repent and identify. That is why some of these assignments cannot be done by a congregation. It will take men with a spiritual insight of intercessory. You can imagine fasting seven days to repent because of the iniquities of the fathers of your land and you don't even know them and the spirit begins to reveal them. Because congregational repentance sometimes is a little bit shallow. It's about what I did and what you did. But this is detailed. And that's why many cities are still held hostage. Because one, the revelation is rare. And number two, 
um, some of these details have been hidden intentionally. And that's why we see the kingdom of the enemy advancing. But I bless the Lord that by this understanding, I know some of you will begin to repent. And I tell you, I, f I can tell you sincerely under the anointing right now because I sense it, I can tell you. Some of the diseases, even in family, whatever people call family diseases, is demonic oppression because of the iniquities of the fathers. When you study the entrance of some diseases, you will discover it, it, the diseases began to manifest. Whatever they call bloodline diseases, it's, it's, it, that's medical language. But I tell you, in the spiritual terminology, you can download and discover this is a demonic manifestation because of iniquities that are in my family. It's the same thing. You know, this iniquity is the same thing. You are born again, but you, you still get diabetes. It doesn't mean you don't have the Holy Ghost. It doesn't mean you don't pray. It doesn't mean you don't know the scripture. So somebody must go beyond speaking in tongues and interrogate the matter in the spirit and ask what is happening. We must get answers. So we see, and they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law and the Lord and God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshipped the Lord their God on the stairs. So we see what they did. Powerful prayers are not where we go and pray without understanding the word. They took a quarter, that's three hours of the day, to read the word. A quarter of the other day to repent. This was serious. This was serious. We were talking about three hours of repentance and then worshipping the Father. Worshipping the Father. So, so powerful prayer. The apostle says, uh, let this work be done by the deacons, the wiping of the tables, so that we may give ourselves into prayer and studying of the word. Prayer and the word go together. The power of your prayers is not in the longevity of the place of prayer. The power of your prayer is in the intensity of the revelation of scripture. You can pray for nine hours and still pray amiss. And you can pray for three hours but under revelation and come out with answers. So it's good for us to have this balance so that you don't love prayer more than you love the word. And again, you don't love the word more than you love prayer. Because if all you do is read the word, you'll just become an intellect without power. If all you do is pray, you might enter some dimensions in the spirit and even begin to manifest some powers, charismatic. And the next thing, you build a very strange ministry. This is where now we find people, men of prayer, who began to touch levels and they will lay hands and people will be delivered. And so they build a ministry on a certain gift because they never had time to understand doctrine. So the gift and doctrine have to be well balanced. So they took time to read the word and time to pray. And we see the Levites. This is the first time we see a type of a... Of a, of a pulpit or of, or of a place where men are exalted so that there is visibility and other people can hear and read them. And then from there, uh, from chapter number 5 all the way to chapter number 38, it is like a summary of the story of the children of Israel. From chapter number 5 all the way to 38, it is a summary. It is a summary. And this summary can be put into nine points. This summary can be put into nine points. This is considered as a hymn. Some people consider this as a hymn or a psalm or something that they declared in their prayer. This is like the content of their prayer. And it is one of the longest. It is the longest in the Bible. If it was a psalm, it is the longest psalm. That, that the longest in terms of it's one flow. It's one note. We don't have a cellar. That means pause and meditate. We don't have a break. It means if it was a psalm, then it was one note all along. If it was something they recited, then they recited it once without a pause, without anything. So it's considered as one of the longest in the Bible. And so by, by just looking at it, we can divide it into nine portions. Number one, verse number six is about praising God as creator. You are the Lord, you alone, you have made the heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all the host, the earth, and all that is on it, the seas, and all that is in them. You preserve all of them, the host of heaven, worship you. There is a whole mystery in this scripture. One, you are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, there is heaven. Then there is the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, 
the heaven the heaven of heavens so there is heaven and there is the heaven of heavens <laughs> with all their hosts and the earth and all that is on it the earth we always know there are three heavens we have the heavens of heavens and the hosts that live in the heavens of heavens. That is the picture you see in Isaiah 6 and also Revelation 4. It is where we have the cherubims and the seraphims. Those are the hosts, the ones that live in that particular area. And then we have the second heaven. We have myriads of the angelic and then the third heaven. That is where we are. So this is the opening part of this prayer, you know, just acknowledging the Lord. And then the second part, we see the covenant with Abraham. Chapter number 7 and 8, the covenant with Abraham. The covenant with Abraham. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you, made him in the covenant. So chapter number 7 and 8 is the covenant of Abraham. Chapter, uh, the third part is great. Uh, it is the great and wonderful acts of God in Egypt. Verse 9 and 11. The scripture talks about the great and wonderful works of God in Egypt. So we begin with praising God as creator. That is verse 6. Verse 7 and 8 is the covenant with Abraham. That's what is the detail. Verse 9 and 11. It talks about the great and wonderful acts of God in Egypt the great and wonderful acts of God in Egypt. The fourth part we see in this particular prayer is that we see the care of God in the desert. Verse 12. In verse 12, you will see the care of God in the desert. By a pill of cloud, you led them in the day, and by a pill of fire in the night, to light for them the way in which they should go. And then uh, verse 13 all the way to 21. Verse 13 all the way to 21. It is Mount Sinai and the desert wandering. Mount Sinai and the desert wandering. It captures that particular uh, entity, the Mount Sinai and the desert wandering. Then verse 22 to 25 is the conquering of the Holy Land. Verse 22 to 25 is the conquering of the Holy Land. The conquering of the Holy Land. Then uh, verse 26 to 31. Verse 26 to 31 is the unfaithfulness of Israel and God's patience in the promised land. Verse 26 to 31, it addresses the unfaithfulness of Israel and God's patience in the promised land. And then verse 32 to 37, it is the confession of sin. The confession of sin. And the ninth part is a commitment to keep God's laws. And this chapter 10 moves from there, a commitment to keep God's laws. So we begin with praising God as creator. These are the nine uh, sections of this particular chapter. Praising God as creator. Number two is covenant with Abraham. Number three is great and wonderful act of God in Egypt. Number four is the care of God in the desert. Number five is Mount Sinai and the desert wandering. Number six is the conquering of the Holy Land. Number seven, the unfaithfulness of Israel and God's patience in the promised land. The unfaithfulness of Israel and God's patience in the promised land. Number eight, the confession of sin. Number nine, a commitment to keep God's law. Now, it's like this prayer point this intercession was a build-up. They begin by acknowledging God, you are God. You made a covenant with our father Abraham. You have been faithful all along. You, even in Egypt, you came and delivered us from Egypt. You came out of Egypt, preserved us in the wilderness. You established us in Canaan. You have been faithful in your dealing. When we entered Canaan, now this is them praying. And they are saying, when our fathers entered Canaan, they were not faithful. They slaughtered your prophets. They never walked under your, your laws. They were not faithful to you. They abandoned the law. That's where iniquity checked in. And because of that, you allowed the hand of the enemy to be upon us. And they now acknowledge their sin and saying, we are where we are. The reason why even though we have harvest, we have to hand over to the king over us is not because you're a wicked God. It's because we have missed the mark. And today we are coming back to you because a real repentance entails a turning around, not just 
a declaration by mouth. It entails a turning around even of actions. So that is the summary uh, of chapter number 9. Uh, we see now Israel after the word. I want you to see the process. The rebuilding of the walls, the declaration of the word, the effect of the word on people, and the effect of the word on the lifestyle of men. Now they have entered into a season of national confession. And then after that, they will enter into a covenant with God and say, chapter number 10, they will say, Lord, we are making a covenant with you. And chapter number 10 is amazing. I can't wait even to read it because we begin to see when there is real restoration, people begin to honor God with their substance. Hallelujah. Father, we bless your name and we thank you. Lord, I know that indeed there are some of us stagnating in life and bound because of the iniquities of the fathers and the sins of the fathers. I know there are families, even diseases manifesting. And I declare, may you raise intercessors in those areas. Reveal to them, open their eyes in the spirit, and let them begin to engage. I declare freedom. I declare open heavens. May this revelation, O oh God, be something that is going to change the lives of many. Thank you for today. Holy Spirit, thank you even for reminding us that we need to arise and confess and repent for the sins and the iniquities of our fathers. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much for everyone that has joined us. Tomorrow is a holiday, but it's a Mashu Jade, and we'll still have the Bible study. It will be an amazing time because you are resting. What a day to just have an evening and look at some matter. Uh, the Bible says that the devil does not rest. He works night and day because he knows he has no time. So we cannot afford to rest. We also have no time. This book has so much. And whatever we can grasp, we need to grasp because there is no time. But the little we have, we invest in it. May God bless you. It's time to give our offerings. It's time to give our substance in worship and adoration of our God. Uh, wherever you are, remember by your giving, we are able to go live. By your giving, we are able to sustain all these things and serve the Lord without sweat. And we bless the Lord for your giving. Our giving details are there. Buy goods and services till number 817370. Truth Mentorship Society is the name you'll see. Buy goods and services 817370. Those who are sending possibly from out of the country and you want the M-Pesa line 0726-714-713. 0726-714-713. And if you want to be receiving the daily bread, which is a scripture I send every day, uh, just to encourage people as they begin their day, you can also send your name and your phone number on 0726 714 713. If you want to be a partner of our vision 2025, which is a vision to buy sound and equipment, a budget of around 50 million, and go back in our high schools and preach the gospel, if you want to be a partner of that vision, we are believing God by 2025 will have all those gears. You can also send your details on 0726 714. 713. May God bless you. May God keep you. May God watch over you and have a blessed Mashujade. Amen.